Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. You're listening to Lunchtime Movie Review from lunchtimemoviereview.com, and we are the children of the 80s. All right, the children of the 80s are back with once again with a review of one of our childhood favorites from the 80s. I'm Patrick. I'm Chris. G'day, I'm Shane A. And this week we are back to review 1989's Weekend at Bernie's. But before we get into our wonderful little review of this classic film, first a word from our sponsor. This podcast is brought to you by Viagra AM. When you absolutely, positively need to keep your body from becoming stiff, Viagra AM. So good, not even your mom will notice. All right, Chris, do you have have a summary for us? Uh, Yeah, I've got the summary. Larry and Richard are two employees at an insurance company in New York City. Richard discovers some fraud at the company, and the two take their findings to their CEO, Bernie, the big mustache Lomax. He commends them for a good job and invites the boys to his place in the Hamptons for the Labor Day weekend. What Larry and Richard don't know is that Bernie is behind the fraud, and during a meeting with his mob buddies later that day, Bernie asks them to kill his two employees. What Bernie doesn't know is that Vito thinks Bernie's greed is attracting too much attention to them, and Vito also knows that Bernie is banging his girlfriend. Vito orders Bernie to be killed instead of Larry and Richard. Back at the Hamptons, Bernie gets a call from Polly, who asks for directions to his house on the island. Somehow, Bernie manages to unknowingly record their conversation on his answering machine, detailing his plans to plant the money and fake a note where Larry and Richard implicate themselves in the fraud and then have him killed. When Polly arrives, he kills Bernie by injecting him with drugs, making it look like an overdose, and then leaves the island. Larry and Richard arrive at Bernie's to find him dead, and the hilarity begins. They debate on calling the police, but are interrupted by the arrival of a floating party to Bernie's place. None of the partiers notice or care to notice that anything is wrong with Bernie. Larry and Richard are torn between their fear of being charged with murder and missing a kick-ass party. So they do what any rational person would do. They pretend he didn't die just for a bit. To add to the zaniness, the woman Richard's been crushing on, Gwen, is there, and he tries his best to get back on her good side after a disastrous date with her the night before. Later, after the party, Tina, Vito's girlfriend, shows up drunk and angry and demands to see Bernie. Of course, she doesn't notice that he's dead as well and has sex with him. If she can get a dead guy up, then she is definitely worth killing for. Conveniently, Marty, another one of Vito's gang, is out on a stroll on the beach in front of Bernie's, and he spots Bernie feeding Tina's kitty in his room. He calls up Vito to let him know that Polly failed and that Bernie is alive. The next day, Larry continues on with the lie that Bernie is still alive, Richard gets angry and decides to end the charade by calling the cops, but is interrupted by the arrival of Gwen. Richard tells Gwen the truth, but she doesn't believe him after all his asinine lies he's told in the film thus far. Polly arrives back on the island and manages to strangle to death the already dead Bernie. Richard goes back to call the cops, and they hear the playback of Bernie's call to Polly about killing them off. They figure out that Bernie is the one committing the fraud and then find the money that Bernie was going to plant on them and the confession note. They call the cops, but Ed is out partying and won't be back for a while to take the call. Still thinking that someone's out to kill them, Larry and Richard continue on with the ruse so they can get off the island. They take Bernie to his boat and set sail for home, but have to return back to the island when the boat runs out of gas. They are forced to paddle back to the Hamptons using Bernie as a flotation device. At Bernie's place, Gwen shows up again, and Richard tells her the truth about Bernie. This time, she believes him after Larry shows her his dead body. Polly shows up again with a gun and shoots Bernie several times. He realizes Larry, Richard, and Gwen witnessed the shooting and chases them with another gun. Richard and Gwen go one way while Larry goes the other. Larry ties up Polly with an extremely long phone cord when he's distracted by a kick to the groin by dead Bernie, and Larry then delivers a cartoon-style punch which knocks Polly to the ground. The police finally arrive to take care of the crime scene, 
and arrest Polly, who's gone insane from all the attempts to kill Bernie. Bernie's loaded into the ambulance, but his gurney ends up rolling down the boardwalk, which hurls him to the beach where Larry, Richard, and Gwen are sitting. This scares them off, leaving him alone until a boy can bury him in the sand, where he will wait four years until we can at Bernie's too. <laughs> well done. Does that sound like comedy gold? Not the way you wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that was long though. That was almost as long as the movie. The Weekend at Bernie's was released in the U.S. on July the fifth, nineteen eighty nine, which is a pretty big weekend, and uh, it opened with four four million five hundred six thousand dollars just for opening weekend. It went on. Uh, for a domestic U.S. gross total of $30 million to $1,000. So that's huge, I thought, considering the budget is un... The budget's un... Um, like, it's not recorded, but I, I couldn't imagine it costing too much. It was released down under in Australia on November the 23rd, 1989. I saw it in a theatre, and I know it did pretty well. It starred Andrew McCarthy, Jonathan Silverman, Catherine Mary Stewart, Terry Kaiser, Catherine Parks. Uh, there was a sequel, as Chris mentioned in his uh, opening summary. That was uh, in 1993. It had a, it also had a US opening weekend of over $4 million, but word must have spread because the total all up for that gross was only $12, $12 million considerably under half of what the original made. And uh, it was released a week after Shag, uh, which was not, not a bad movie. It was a comedy uh, musical. It was released the same day on July the 5th as Haunted Summer. That's the Eric Stoltz, Laura Dern classic depicting the weekend of uh, Mary Shelley when she wrote her story Frankenstein. And a week later, Lethal Weapon 2 came out. So there was a large variety of movies at the time to choose from. Rotten Tomatoes. Now, I don't give Rotten Tomatoes a lot of credit, but uh, here we go anyway. It's 52% on the tomato meter, and the audience score on Rotten Tomatoes gives it 57%. But there are no critics' consensus yet. Uh, surprise, surprise. We'll start with what I think was probably one of the most surprising things about this film. In, when, and I, too, like Shane, saw it in the theater. I saw it in July of 1989. We went to go see it on some Friday, random Friday or Saturday night. And I liked it. I liked it at the time. But this is the summer of 89. And Shane touched on some films, Haunted Summer, not one of the big glowing, you know, glowing huge box office hits or Shag, not as well. Lethal Weapon 2, big hit. But a few weeks just before this, I think almost two weeks before this, Batman comes out, the biggest film of that year. A month before that, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, uh, Star Trek V, not the best of the Star Trek series by any stretch of the imagination, Ghostbusters 2, When Harry Met Sally comes out a few weeks after this one. I mean, this summer of 89 was huge. Field of Dreams was even still out at this time. I mean, there was this was a big summer. There was a lot of good films that came out. And does this when you watch this film, do you go, oh, obviously summer blockbuster? <laughs> Uh, no, but it was just different. And I think coming out of the 80s into the 90s it was perfect, a no-brainer. But it had a lot of competition around it, but nothing similar. Well, I think that's one of the reasons why it did well at the time. It was pretty different than all the other movies that were out that summer. And I think I saw most of the movies that Patrick just mentioned. And I do remember seeing Weekend at Bernie's uh, when it came out as well. And I think it stood toe to toe back then in my mind with all those movies, but um, you know, things change. Let's be clear. <laughs> it does not stand toe to toe with lethal weapon two or Indiana Jones and the last crusade, or even by that stretch of the imagination, Batman, which is not my, one of my favorite films either. Arguably you could say it's as good as ghostbusters two or star Trek five, but ghostbusters two, it's as good as I actually don't, think that indiana jones the last crusade is is as good as this film or, or not today but when i saw it back in the day ah, break my heart. <laughs> that's funny uh, i thought last crusade was better than temple of doom i still do uh but nothing compares to raiders of course 
Uh, Ghostbusters 2, I watched again last year after a long period of not seeing it, and it hasn't really hold, held up that well. But personally, I, I might be the wrong person to speak to about Weekend at Bernie's because it has always been on the top of my uh, comedy lists whenever anyone asks me what my favourite comedies are. I still love it. And I, I was falling off the lounge chair over and over again when I was re-watching it for this podcast. It's an undisputed comedic piece of fine retro art. I love it. Well, we found the right man for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one of the things I do like about it more now is the retro look of the 80s. I mean, they really, it, you really get a good sense of the, the 80s in this film. Well, yeah, that, I mean, that's, if you're looking at it now, I think the funniest parts of it is that people actually dress like that, and we didn't think twice of it no. at the time, is that, that the way what they're wearing at the beach, what they're wearing at the office, uh, it, it just, you know, uh, especially a lot of the the big shoulder pad women's outfits and things like that, it's, it's very striking. It's like, wow, am I watching Working Girl? I mean, it just it is it's a very <laughs> different look, and it's very entertaining to just see that it's like I'm watching a futuristic film of people that, you know, like uh, uh, advanced futuristic fashions. Cause it just d seems so bizarre compared to what we're used to now. And those um, high up on the hip bikini bottoms that the <laughs> girls wear, <laughs> they're very high. Yes. I mean, I, that's what I was watching is the, the high up on the hips. <laughs> <laughs> There was a lot of smoking going on too. Uh, Andrew McCarthy smokes in the foyer of the uh, um, building at the start. And I didn't like how Bernie, I noticed he threw his cigarette butt over the uh, side of the boat near the start too. Yeah, time that, to change. Think... Would this film have gotten an R for all the smoking alone if it was made today? I'm sure I, they I wouldn't think... have him smoking, but... I think that's what you would have seen is they wouldn't have had him smoking. I don't think you would get an R rated for just smoking. Um, depends on what you're smoking, but yeah. you know, you know, there's, there was definitely drug use in this. So I think you probably would have gotten an R rating just for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that alone. Yeah. The drug use was innuendo though, wasn't it? When Bernie went into the room in his office and then out again and started twitching, I didn't see anything. Well, so the one girl comes along and is trying to find drugs and she looks in his, oh, yeah the pocket it says thank you or something like that. Uh, thank you. And hey, God was, it seemed like there was another part, but maybe I'm forgetting it. I don't know. It, it's, it kind of blurs together. I watched this a couple of weeks ago, so I've, I've tried to regress it back into my distant memory. You know, some of the things that held up for me though, um, in this film is, uh, Terry Kisser's, uh, his stupid look on his face. And I think I, because I've seen this so many times, I just tried to watch, to see if he just broke out of that that face when Andrew McCarthy was kind of slapping around. He's, he was actually kind of rough on him for uh, being an actor who's really not dead. And I was just amused by trying to watch his face to see if he would react at all to Andrew smacking him or jerking his head back and forth. But that look on his face still gets me to this day. I think they must have used a... Um... I don't know if they did or not, but if they use some kind of mannequin or body double in certain scenes, maybe from a distance, when he was getting uh, the close-ups were him, but when he was getting washed in and out on the on the beach in the surf, I'm pretty sure that was like a dummy. <laughs> I, I, it was just too stiff and it was floating too much. It, he's too heavy. He would have been on the sand, I think. Well, he is reality. a method actor, so maybe. I, I did notice watching it on a HD TV. Uh, there's a scene where where they're trying to run. They've got their shoes, uh, shoelaces all tied together, and they're running on the jetty towards the boat. And they miss the boat. Mm -hmm. He's sweating. I could see sweat on Bernie's head, and I'd <laughs> never noticed that before. I think it was because of that. It was shiny, and then I looked closely on my TV, and I think he was sweating. And it was also when they were playing Monopoly or something. I think he was taking, like, little breaths then just the HD TV made it so much clearer. I'm used to the VHS. <laughs> All right. Well, that, that's it, Shane. You've, you submitted my opinion. There's no truth to this art. If, he, that, if the dead man can sweat, then this film. <laughs> yeah. They can sweat, but they don't wear plaid. You know, one of the things that watching it this time that really bothered me more than it did at the beginning is um, Jonathan Silverman's character, Richard Parker. I thought he was, 
his character was just over the top whiny. Uh, more, I noticed it more now than I did back in the day when I used to watch this, but I couldn't stand his character from beginning to end in this one. And um, it, it really bothered me this time. His character bothered me too, but probably for a different, completely different reason is what started to bother me about it. And I didn't remember this of the, of the plot line is just this constant lying to the Catherine Mary Stewart character yeah. that it was like, he's supposed to be kind of the good guy of the two. And he's as big a dick as the Larry character. I thought he was um, bigger it, because he's telling these needless lies constantly that he doesn't have to do. Uh, either out of nervousness or just, you know, embarrassment. And, you know, it, the idea that he's supposed to be the good one is like, oh, we need to call the police. Oh, wait, there's, there's the girl I like. Oh, 15 minutes. Oh, half hour. Oh, we'll do it tomorrow. Oh, well, you know, it's it's always he's making excuses and not doing the right thing for to go try to woo the girl that he's constantly lying to. And that it, it, it just started to become annoying to me after a while. It's mm -hmm. just like, I'm supposed to like somebody here and I, I don't like Richard. I don't like Larry and I definitely don't like Bernie. So who am I supposed to like? I liked Bernie, <laughs> not, not the living Bernie, but dead Bernie was great. He got along with everybody. Defend your film, Shane. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I kind of agree that Jonathan Silverman did annoy me a little bit too. Uh, he is playing off a pretty manic Andrew McCarthy, though. And I think that that scene where they're having uh, their date at home and the dad walks out in the middle of the night, yeah, I think uh, I have a feeling that um, probably Richard was has been wanting to go out with Gwen for so long and then finally Larry sort of makes him ask her at the office and then things are starting to progress a little bit. He doesn't want to screw it up. So he, one lie turns into another, into another, into another. And he's just, it's all nervous anxiety. I think that's, that's what I put it down to. But as an actor, I think uh, Jonathan uh, Silverman just has annoyed me in everything. Caddyshack 2, Death Becomes Her. I think he was even in Girls Just Want to Have Fun. He's in Death Becomes yeah. Her. I don't remember him in Death Becomes Her. Yeah, he's got a he's got a small role in that too. Similar character. Is he walking around the dead body? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well they're dead. They're dead in that movie. Right? I know they are dead. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> well, now what about what about help. Catherine Mary Stewart though? She's she's like a bit of an icon of the eighties, and she was pretty good in this. Or, or as Jason would say, because I talked to him about reviewing this film tonight with him today, and he said, oh, you mean the poor man's Elizabeth Shue? <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good description of her. Uh, okay. <laughs> Shane, <laughs> Shane is stunned into silence on that one. Uh, I think that her character is pretty flat for this film, though. I mean, she was, she was pretty much every typical 80s girl in a film in this one is pretty uh, stereotypical. There, there was nothing really added to her. She didn't even seem like she was a more intelligent person than the, the two guys in this one. Yeah, you're right. But she was there for, along for the ride, and it's not one of her best roles, but mm. I've got to say she's probably had better quality of films than Elizabeth Shue has in the <laughs> 80s. Or around this time. I'm not including leaving the Las Vegas, but A Night on the Town and Cocktail are the only two Elizabeth Shue ones I can think of that made an impact for me. And she was a bit young to do anything for me in Karate Kid. Adventures in Babysitting, Karate Kid. I like um, Adventures in Babysitting. Back to, well, no, that's what I'm saying is Elizabeth Shue had some certified hits. Oh, oh, didn't I say that? It's called A Night on the Town here. Oh, is so, that what it's called? Adventures in Babysitting? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's called A Night on the Town, so Adventures in Babysitting. For sure. That's her that's her highlight of her entire career. Was she a Karate Even, Kid? Yes. Yeah. She's the love interest to Ralph Macho and Karate Kid. That's right. Whose character eventually dumps him right away for Karate Kid Part Two. That but bitch. Catherine Mary Stewart, I mean, she's I mean, she's in a lot of things, but I can't say that any one of them is really good. Last Starfighter? I like Last oh, Starfighter. Okay. That's I, I, I said really good. I'm still waiting. Okay. For <laughs> what do you mean? That, that's really good? Last Starfighter is an entertaining little film, but yeah. it, it's like she is like no importance to that storyline at all. It's the Not other the comment. That was all right. I don't really like Night of the Comet. 
It's it's been a long time since I've seen it, but I, I didn't really like it when I saw it. And yeah. the app well, that wouldn't say the apple is a good movie, but but it's a cult movie. The apple, your your musical film. Yeah, she was in. Yeah, mm-hmm. I didn't know she was in that. She was BB. Well, I know both of you loved that film. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Nerd alert. <laughs> Now, I want to talk about one of my favorite scenes in the film, and I think Shane likes this one too, is the boat scene where Andrew McCarthy can't figure out how to uh, how to uh, drive the boat. But the part that still kills me to this day, and I know uh, Shane likes it, is when they're going near those buoys and uh, Bernie keeps hitting each one and the, ringing the bell, and they're like, they don't know where the, the noise is coming from. That makes me laugh every time from the day I saw it till today. Totally agree. Without fail, that's one of the moments I fall off the lounge. Every time Andrew McCarthy says, did you hear that? What was that? <laughs> and they turn around. It's just it's hilarious. Uh, and I like it when they um, are vacuuming him after he's been buried in the sand <laughs> from that kid and they're vacuuming him <laughs> and all the sand of him and then his toupee comes off. That, that cracks me up too. He wasn't really wearing a toupee though in this. That was just for the comedic effect, right? Yeah, when he when it comes off, you have a look at his uh, like his chrome dome, and it's a fake. You can okay. see that it's a yeah. fake chrome dome. Yeah, I didn't think the actor himself was bald. Yeah, you could tell there was no sweat, so you know that he was wearing. It. <laughs> uh, okay, well, one thing when I was kind of researching the film, I thought it was very interesting is this was actually originally intended to be a Corey Haim, Corey Feldman film. <laughs> really. Yeah, that they originally that was who they intended to cast in the film, but decided to go with older actors, uh, <laughs> so they could go make Dream a Little Dream, I guess. But uh, you know, to drive. around it could have been around that time. I think License to Drive was the year before. I think Dream a Little Dream came out in '89, but it was uh, it's uh, you know I think that would have been an interest a much different type of film and would have skewed much younger than. Andrew McCarthy and Jonathan Silver. Yeah, because the Corys are like our age, and if you were having the same story, I wouldn't buy them as working at an insurance company. Too young for that. They did make a movie on a tropical island in 1994 called Last Resort or National Lampoon's Last Resort. Maybe it was a – they couldn't get them together for Bernie, so they put them together for that. Well, maybe they could make a third one and Corey Haim could play Bernie. Well, I think because the second Bernie flopped so badly and there was too much time in between, so the novelty would have just worn off. And it was a stupid premise anyway, but because it flopped the second one, there was a third one planned, but that got scrapped. How long can you have a dead guy uh, fool everybody that he's dead? I don't see how they could have gone for a three. Yeah, the concept was hilarious, I thought, to begin with, and still holds up. <laughs> this the Swiss Army man basically does that again, only on a, on a higher, more absurd scale. So the concept is still there. But to do a sequel back in the late 80s, early 90s of a movie, you've got to keep it pretty tight because I, I would have thought that things move on and it didn't really work. And the, the premise of Bernie coming to life when he heard voodoo music or voodoo sounds or something from memory uh was was bad yeah that's that's not good at all anything else on birdie our weekend at birdies not from me shane shane you love this film i do i still love it and i i have already mentioned the cameo from the director he is uh jonathan silverman's dad in that scene where they're at the date i thought that was funny and I think the lexicon of just the parodies of Weekend at Bernie's that it has spawned over the years. I mean, The Simpsons and Saturday Night Live, and it just, it's endless. So it's still part of like the retro cult classics on many people's lists. So it's not just me that really enjoys it. Uh, And I get a laugh out of it every time. Although it's kind of surprising that he doesn't die for the first, you know, 30, 40 minutes of the film. And so you're really just trying to get to know the characters a little bit. And the more you watch it, the more they are annoying, Larry and uh, Richard. But it's still cool. I still think it's funny and I'm glad we did it for a podcast. All right. Well, you seem to have led us into 
Uh, did you like it then? And do you like it now? And do you believe it stands the test of time? <laughs> so I'll let you answer those questions. Uh, I admit on a, on a whole, it may not as, be as constantly hilarious as it was the first 10 years I was watching it. But now some 28 years later, uh, I, I'm still enjoying it. So I've forgotten how many times I've seen it. I think it stands the test of time just, uh, even though I really love it. I think overall it's not going to um, make people laugh as much as me, but I highly recommend it. And I, it's just one of those great 80s films that never never gets old. You know, when I, this came out, I love this film tremendously. It made me laugh every time, but I probably haven't seen this I don't know, since the early 90s. It's been a very long time. And uh, it's it's definitely not as good as it was back in the day. There's still a lot of stuff that made me laugh. As I mentioned, the, the scene with the buoys um, or the buoys or the David buoys. Um, but uh, also the scene where Larry and Bernie are out on the patio playing the Monopoly. And uh, and he says hi to the girls and swats them with the, with the fly swatter. That still kills me every time and the, the stupid look on Bernie's face. When Bernie washes up on the shore, when Richard and Gwen are making out and he's looking right at him with that stupid smirk, um, you know, that also makes me laugh. I guess if you take the stupid smirk off, this film has no merit whatsoever. <laughs> I think that's what I'm saying. Um, and because of that, uh, this is not going to stand the test of time for me. It's, it's a little cheesy now. It's too, Richard's too over the top for me. And but it, it's still got its moments, but it's definitely not. Honestly, this is a film that I might not watch again after this. Ah. Oh. All, right. <laughs> All right. Well, Chris, I'll actually go deeper on you. That I, I think, you know, I saw this in the '80s. I saw it in the theater. I enjoyed it when I saw it in the theater. I was very surprised. I'm shocked to think of it now as a summer film. Um, because it is not, it has nothing about it that screams blockbuster appeal to me or that it will, would survive in those kind of choppy waters. Um, but I think one of the most entertaining aspects of this film now is the time capsule element of kind of the idea of what the eighties were as, as far as fashion, which we've kind of talked about, but also kind of this idea of greed and that, the the characters are very symbolic of kind of the era where everyone was kind of out for themselves. And, why why I cannot get, you know, I don't find an access point for a character that I can relate to is because the characters are very 80s driven. Richard is driven by wanting to um, be with Gwen and and Larry is all about w wanting to rise up the corporate ladder as easily as possible, kissing ass or, you know, greasing palms, whatever it takes, and very worried about his reputation that neither one of them really cares for the other. They're, they're all kind of out for themselves. And obviously Bernie is the, the epitome of that. So to go very deep, like you usually do, Chris, is that th this film, the flaws of this film that I have problems with now, I probably wouldn't have had it in 1989 because that was kind of the era. And that was kind of the, that's eighties were all about the individual, everybody trying to climb up the, the ladder and get what, what they is for themselves. The same, the same idea that we've talked about before talking about back to the future the end of the film is that he ends up, everything is better and he gets his dream car and everything works out and his, 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 his family has global success. But that was the era of the time. That was how you had a happy ending. And that's how these characters had to happy, have a happy ending. That being said, I don't like the film. I don't think it stands the test of time. I think it's, it's extremely dated. I just th thought it was an inter interesting point that I just want to throw out there at the end. Uh, I did not enjoy watching it. I I don't remember a lot of the comedy in it, uh, but it's slapstick and it doesn't slapstick comedy doesn't you know wear well for me. After a while, it's it's okay. Yeah, he's he's hitting the buoys. Oh yeah, he kicks the the assassin in the groin. You know, it just it's. It just doesn't have repeat viewing for, for me. And I, like you, Chris, have not seen it since the, the late, probably the early 90s. Um, but I did see it multiple times, probably four or five times, but it's been well over 20 years. And going back and revisiting this, uh, I went, yeah, I don't, I, I think I'm probably probably done with film. I don't need to watch it again. Stri strangely enough, I know I've seen Weekend at Bernie's 2, but I cannot really remember anything about that film. And I know I only saw that one once. So <laughs> that's one I don't plan to go revisit in any way, shape, or form. 
the voodoo that Shane was mentioning is pretty much the only thing that uh, I can remember from it. Yeah, it's terrible. Uh, I rewatched it maybe a year or so ago, and it's it's horrible. I think you both would love Weekend at Bernie's if you had to watch Weekend at Bernie's <laughs> 2 again. Uh, you know, and just to add what Patrick said, you're right. It's the end of the 80s, 80s excess. So the whole, that house is just amazing, you know, and, you know, the disregard of um, property and people just throwing money around and offers for this and that and the, the drinking and the parties. I mean, it doesn't, I guess it doesn't happen as much these days, but it was a, a it's just the era of what happened and it was made fun of, you know, it wasn't taken seriously. And Bernie had his, he got uh, laid while he was dead and she was totally satisfied. I thought that was pretty funny as well. And uh, Andrew McCarthy's line, oh, well, that, I, I always get, get yelled at when I don't move. So I, I think things like that were they it holds up, you know. I just little things like that. He's he had everyone else had a golf cart. He had like a sports car golf cart. It was yeah, a Porsche like to that. match his Porsche in New York City. <laughs> yeah, so I just love the little details. It was just it just makes me laugh every time. The little smart ass kid, you know, things like that. So, anyway. All right, that does it for this week's review of Weekend at Bernie's. Thanks again for joining us and listening to our little bi-weekly podcast if you had a good time the fun doesn't have to stop here uh, you can follow us on facebook at lunchtime movie review or on twitter at lunchtime movie on either facebook or twitter you can keep up on our written film reviews news on upcoming films and blu-ray releases and information on upcoming podcasts on the mhm podcast network including film house hustlers mail bonding the number two review and movie house concessions and if you've enjoyed yourselves and you download us off either iTunes or Stitcher, make sure to rate our podcast on either one of those two platforms. And if you have a chance, write a short review of the podcast. Of course, we always like the reviews that are positive, but we appreciate any feedback that we can get from any listeners of the show. Well, that does it for this episode of Lunchtime Moo Review. Uh, until next time, I'm Patrick. I'm Chris. I'm Shane A. Bye for now. Uh, and we got to get out of here right now, and you guys are invited. This podcast is not endorsed by 20th Century Fox and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Weekend at Bernie's, all names and sounds of Weekend and Bernie's characters and any other Weekend and Bernie's related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of 20th Century Fox or the respective trademark and our copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Lunchtime Movie Review, the MHM Podcast Network, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment LLC, unless otherwise noted.